Hello, everyone. This is Vince Versace, National Managing Editor of the Daily Commercial News and Journal of Commerce, joining you today for this special feature interview, which uh, will run uh, during our election night broadcast brought to you by the DCN and JOC. I am speaking with Mark Romoff, uh, former president and CEO of uh, the Canadian Council for Public Private Partnerships. Mark, welcome to the broadcast and the feature interview on election night. <laughs> Thank you, Vince. Always great to spend time with you. Yeah, same here. Uh, to make clear, as I was saying, tra full transparency to people that will be catching this interview, we are, Mark and I are talking before the polls close uh, because we both want to have time to actually watch everything tonight. So <laughs> <laughs> uninterrupted, uh, but no, it was just easier to do this this way. Um, and Mark, yes, is a, a former president and CEO of, uh, as I was saying, of the council. But he's not speaking on behalf of them, nor is he speaking on behalf of the current bodies and consulting that he's doing now. Uh, like one of the things being you're on the board of Infrastructure Ontario, you were saying, Mark, but you're not speaking on behalf of Infrastructure Ontario. No. no. But we brought you here because of your expertise on the file of infrastructure and public-private partnerships and the investment that goes into those two items in the context of this election. I thought you'd be the best person to kind of speak to you around those two topics. So uh, thank you for joining us on that. My pleasure. Okay, so I'll start off with that is like, describe for us how you think uh, the issue and advocacy around infrastructure and P3 has gone on this federal election, uh, in this federal election campaign. Has it registered on the radar for you? Have, have they paid enough attention to it, the leaders? Yeah, well, well, let me set the scene a little bit if I can. I mean, first yeah. of all, my, my sense of it is that every government around the world recognizes the importance of investing in public infrastructure. Right? They, they all know that um, this kind of investment, without a doubt, grows the economy, it creates jobs, it stimulates productivity, and maybe most importantly in a Canadian context, it really enhances a country's global competitiveness. And these are really important uh, economic measures, certainly in Canada. And so from that perspective, all the parties um, would clearly endorse the importance of investing in infrastructure, right? How we do it, uh, different views around that, without a doubt. But the reality is that it is absolutely key and, and no more so um, as we're hoping to put uh, COVID behind us and very much focusing on economic recovery. So I think it's a given that infrastructure is important. What's interesting is that um, when you look at the platforms of the parties, there's a little mention of infrastructure, not a lot. I mean, some of it is overt, a lot of it is covert, right? right? Um, and so what I find interesting is that in fact, there has been no uh, specific reference uh, to infrastructure. You don't hear the word in the campaign. It was mm -hmm. never mentioned in any of the debates. Um, and you don't see it as a term that's quoted um, in media coverage. Mm -hmm. And yet the reality is that um, it's probably the most important element behind the curtain, if you like, <laughs> right. for all the issues that have been raised during the campaign. So when you think about what people or what the leaders and what the candidates are talking about, it's things like affordable housing, right? Everyone talks about affordable housing the need to um, really grow out our broadband coverage across the country to digitizing the Canadian economy. It's about the importance of public transit as a driver of, um, of productivity. We hear lots about climate change and, and um, green technologies and net zero emissions. It's at the heart of so much of the discussion that's taken place. And we're also, of course, hearing about the needs of Indigenous peoples around Canada. Yeah, part of it is reconciliation, no doubt. But as you and I both know, Indigenous communities have huge infrastructure challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, the Council did a survey a few years back, and just for First Nations alone, that Indigenous uh, or infrastructure gap was pegged at around 25 to $30 billion. And that survey is is a while back now and it's only for First Nations, not counting uh, other groups. So you know that these are big issues that are being discussed right now by all the candidates. And yet the solution 
uh, or the way in which you address most of these issues is around investing in the needed infrastructure. So without a doubt, if we talk about affordable housing, then get launching a real housing plan in Canada mm -hmm. is gonna be anchored in making those kinds of public investments in order to make it happen. And that, and that goes um, for all of the, I believe, I have a bias obviously, but yeah, I right. for all the issues that have been raised in the campaign, there's an undercurrent of uh, infrastructure investment that will be key to realizing um, what uh, the various parties are hoping to achieve over the course of their mandate. Yeah, they'll approach it differently. We can mm -hmm. talk a little bit about that. But I think it's at the heart of it all. And so um, that's the key here. And the other thing, too, you, I think you hear it um, almost in every uh, public speech uh, by the candidates. They're mm -hmm. talking about the importance of partnering with all levels of government with uh, the provinces, with the uh, territories, with municipalities, with indigenous communities, the importance of partnership in order to enable these various issues to be addressed and addressed with impact. And that, while it's not public-private partnership, the concept of partnerships is at the heart of exactly uh, what we're talking about. So from my perspective, while it's not out there, as uh, an issue that people can relate to. It in mm -hmm. fact, as I said, is sort of, you know, behind the curtain. Um, that's what's really taking place here in order to enable all of the big um, uh, programs and initiatives that the leaders are promoting. That'll be key to enabling them to realize them. All right. How about um, an issue that, because we're kind of a bit more in a bubble with the publications that we are in your former role around the Canada Infrastructure Bank? The, mm -hmm. its future you listen to yeah. the liberals they did pay some attention to it you know they would continue with it but we have the ndp and the conservatives that say they would pull the plug yeah, yeah. where do you sit as far as the infrastructure bank uh, what needs to be done does it need a reset does it need its plug pulled or um where do you stand with that from how you well, how do you see it i mean yeah. yeah it's a good question because again it's 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 caught up a little bit in the politics uh, right. of the day right mm -hmm. and, and i get that um, but if you think back about what was the rationale behind establishing the bank, I mean, it was quite similar to the rationale behind creating uh, PPP Canada in its day mm -hmm. when the Conservatives um, were in power. So the intent of the bank, a little more specific, it's about enabling large, complex, much riskier projects to come successfully to market, right? Mm -hmm. And so no one will debate, I don't believe, with the mandate or the rationale, you, you need some kind of mechanism to enable these much more complex projects that um, you know, the private sector might be a little averse to taking on in the same way. So yes, having an, um, an entity like the bank or some other mechanism to help reduce the risk, to share in the financial uh, needs in order to enable it to come to market, I think, pretty realistic um, reason to have some kind of mechanism. So whether it's a bank or some other vehicle, um, you know, that that's uh, up to the folks in power to decide. I, I do believe that uh, the bank is at the moment on a very good footing. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, over the course of the last year and a little bit, um, there was a new chair of the board brought in, a new CEO of the bank, um, changes in the board of directors, a stronger mandate and more flexibility in terms of the kinds of projects they can engage with and a, and a particular focus being placed on indigenous communities, which, right. which I have a particular um, personal commitment to. So uh, I think that at, at the moment, the bank is on um, much more solid footing and uh, we'll see what happens, obviously, in the election and, mm -hmm. and then what decisions are made around the future of the bank. But I think irrespective, you do need a vehicle like that that can work closely with governments around the country and the private sector in order to enable more infrastructure to get built. Because, again, it comes back to the point I was making a little bit earlier about the importance of infrastructure.
we, we all get that. Mm -hmm. So I, I, think, um, I, I think you need vehicles like this um, to partner with the private sector. And the thing I like about the bank, by the way, is that it now has a mandate too for unsolicited proposals. And as you would know, Vince, Mm -hmm. Historically, that's not um, that's not been an approach that's been adopted in Canada, but now it's becoming more and more um, recognizable as a way in which to bring infrastructure to market. So the bank has that mandate. The government of Ontario, the government of Alberta, they've mm -hmm. all um, engaged uh, now in putting in place policy frameworks to enable unsolicited proposals. So here is an opportunity now for the private sector to bring their intellect, their innovation uh, to the fore. Again, it's public infrastructure, but nonetheless, right. engaging the private sector in a way that enables them to make a valued contribution to the dialogue around how to advance the infrastructure agenda, I think very positive. Um, so those are general comments. I'm, right. Well, I think back to some of the past conferences uh, when you were with uh, the council, and near the end, um, the tenor and kind of, not the tenor, but the topics and the concerns around uh, transferring risk and liability seem to be some of these pinch points in trying to bring some yeah. of these projects to bear, let alone interest to bring yeah. these projects to bear. Um, there's nothing really in this campaign that's kind of looked at that. You know, and it's kind of like driven by the market itself, it seems like the change, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, that's right. But there's yeah. no doubt that, um, again, no matter how you choose to procure your infrastructure, whether it's in traditional ways or public-private partnerships or new models. And there are new models coming uh, mm -hmm. to the market, things like Alliance, other approaches that are out there. Irrespective of that, I think what's really important, again, is we get back to the fundamental issue around how governments engage with the private sector in an open and transparent and partnering way in mm -hmm. order to get the benefit of that kind of collective uh, insight and decision making. So I think what you're seeing is that um, agencies like Infrastructure Ontario, Metrolinx, uh, SAS builds, others mm -hmm. around the country um, are looking at the model and saying, all right, it's important for us to continually improve it, recalibrate it where necessary in order to ensure that in fact, we are partnering with the private sector in ways that makes it attractive to them to bid these projects, um, while at the same time, of course, making sure that we're protecting the interests mm -hmm. of taxpayers. And you and I fall in that category, so we have a vested interest right. in too. <laughs> but I think that um, this commitment to, to, to making this process around investing in infrastructure an evergreen one, mm -hmm. um, so that it's in, in a mode of constant improvement. And I've always felt when it came to P3s, for instance, that um, projects and contracts got better and better with every contract signed, right? There's mm -hmm. always a learning there on the part of both governments and the private sector. And I think that's really uh, constructive and important and positive. Perfect. All right. Well, as we wrap up, and uh, I'll ask you, I'm sure you don't have to answer. Do you have a prediction for how this is going to turn out? <laughs> when it, when the last vote was counted, do you, do you want to go down that road or <laughs> share it with us? Um, you know, it's, um, I, I spent, uh, the first, <laughs> I spent the first 25 years of my life and mm. my career as a diplomat, uh, right. serving uh, Canada's interests on the global stage. Mm -hmm. And the one thing I learned, which is most important is that, um, you serve with enthusiasm, the party in power. Right. And so for me, um, all I want is, um, is a good, solid election, a positive outcome, and governments that are committed to really making a difference for mm -hmm. Canada. And I think they all are committed to that. Mm -hmm. And and so I'm not trying to avoid uh, the question. <laughs> I just have a much more sort of egalitarian view of the mm -hmm. world. Right. And I just want a good outcome. Um, and then I want to see, to the extent possible, parties coming together in a way that's really going to enable us to advance uh, Canada's agenda, because it is really important. And as I mentioned at the outset, coming out of COVID, there's no more important time to get us back on a solid footing. 
And I'm hoping that this election will enable us to, to do just that. Exactly. Well said. And it's for the benefit of all, no matter what the political strike. Right. You know what I mean? It's a great country and we got to just keep moving it forward united as best we can, right? We are very lucky to be here in Canada. Yeah. All right. With that, Mark, uh, I want to thank you so much. And also, I want to take the opportunity to thank you for the years of partnership and support for those that are familiar with, who are familiar with the work of the council and the daily commercial news around your yearly um, conference. We would put together for the last five years or so the P3 Daily Reporter, which was the newspaper yeah. at the conference. And I wanted to thank you for helping you know, establish that partnership and opportunity. I think we both really benefited from it, and so did the people at the conference themselves. Yeah. So, without a doubt, you know, and and uh, and to be frank, uh, you mm -hmm. guys are a class operation, top to bottom, mm -hmm. and so it made a huge difference for us because we knew that uh, folks who come to the conference really wanted that kind of of feature and update and news, and um, you guys are so good at that, right? <laughs> and you did some wonderful interviews on site and virtually right. last time around, mm -hmm. and so. Uh, it's a huge value add. I mean, I, again, obviously, I've stepped away from right. that end this year, but I know that the organizers of our of the mm -hmm. council conference this year feel exactly the same way. So keep it up, man. You're for sure you're a, a great operation. So thank you very much. No problem. I'm sure you're going to keep up bringing that expertise that you do all the time and that passion, whichever okay. file you're on. So with that, Mark Romoff, everyone, thank you very much. Thank you, Vince. Take we'll care. talk again after today. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> Sounds like it. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Great chatting. With Great you. talking to you. Bye.